Welcome back to the channel everyone. My name is Noble Inasu and in the last video we went through 10 strategies to reduce your sugar cravings. But how do we know when our blood levels are off? What do we need to check in our blood tests? And what do all those terms like OGTT, GCT, fasting glucose, HbA1c, C-peptide, etc. all mean? It might seem like you need a degree in diabetes to just understand this code language. And that's exactly what diabetologists do, but it's not as hard as it seems. So in this video, we are going to do just that. Let us go through each of these tests and see what they mean. What tests are important? And and what they tell you about your health. Now, diabetic patients need constant monitoring of blood sugar levels. Before we move on to the lab tests, I have explained how we develop insulin resistance and subsequently diabetes in this video right here. So if you want to have a recap, go ahead and watch that. But if we are up to date with the basics, then without further ado, let's discuss our first test, the random blood glucose level. When your doctor suspects diabetes based on your symptoms, random blood glucose is the basic test that a doctor would do. What are these symptoms? The Classic symptoms of diabetes are wanting to pass urine too often, being hungry all the time, and being very thirsty. Now, depending on the stage of diabetes, one could also have issues with their eyesight, brain fog, tingling and numbness in the feet, and so on. But just having one of these symptoms or even some of them does not mean you are surely diabetic. If you have these symptoms and have a random blood glucose sugar level of more than 180 milligrams per deciliter, mg slash dl, that's what you see in the tests, that's when one is diagnosed with diabetes. The good part of this test is that you can give your blood at any time of the day, ideally two hours after your meal, and it will show you the normal state of sugar in your blood. At a clinic, the random blood glucose level is what is assessed in the glucose challenge test or GCT, where the lab would check your blood sugar level after one to two hours of drinking glucose water. This is also the same as the sugar level that you get when you're using an at-home finger prick device. Moving on to our next test and the next most common one used to diagnose diabetes, fasting blood sugar. The fasting blood sugar levels give clues on how the body is managing the overall blood sugar. The principle is simple. When you're fasting and no food is in the system for several hours, it gives a clear picture of your blood chemistry without any effect of any food. A high fasting blood glucose indicates insulin resistance and diabetes, whereas extremely low values in diabetics less than 70 milligrams per deciliter tell that a person is in hypoglycemia or simply low blood sugar. This can be because of various reasons, but in diabetics, it most probably could be due to improper dosage of medications and this needs to be looked into and adjusted by your physician. In a clinic or a lab, for fasting blood glucose, there should be no caloric intake for 8 hours before giving blood. A value of 126 milligrams per deciliter or higher indicates diabetes. Once again, if you have a finger prick test device at home, checking the level immediately after waking up before eating any food would give you an idea of your fasting blood sugar at home, but it would be best to take one at the lab if you're concerned about how precise the value would be. Moving on to a very important test, the HbA1c or glycogen hemoglobin. Let us break this HbA1c down. Hb stands for hemoglobin, A stands for adult, and 1c is a subtype of adult hemoglobin that attaches to sugar. So to put it simply, HbA1c is an adult red blood cell with sugar attached to it. And once sugar attaches to a blood cell, it stays with it till that blood cell dies. How dedicated. In all our bodies, our red blood cells live for about 120 days or around 3 months. So if we have a lot of sugar in our blood, it starts to get attached to the red blood cells and dies in about 3 months. So if we measure this in the lab, it will give us an exact picture of how bad your sugar levels are over a period of 3 months. And for this reason, HbA1c remains a gold standard for predicting diabetes. HbA1c results are reported in percentages. The higher the percentage, the higher your blood sugar level over the past couple of months. Ideally, we need to keep our HbA1c levels below 6%. This also helps you understand how well your treatment is working if you already have diabetes. Next, we need to look into our insulin levels. Your GP may ask you to test test your insulin levels as well. Diabetes can cause fluctuations in insulin hormones. Knowing how much insulin is effectively being used or not is essential for understanding the other side of the diabetes equation. Is your pancreas making enough insulin or not? In type 1 diabetes, you don't have enough insulin and you depend on external sources to provide insulin. However, in type 2 diabetes, insulin is being rejected by cells due to insulin resistance. So when the pancreas is producing a lot of insulin but your cells don't respond, it accumulates in the blood. 
important. It is important for people with diabetes to closely monitor their insulin levels and make adjustments to their treatment as needed. This can help prevent blood sugar levels from becoming too high or too low, which can lead to complications. Now, riding along with our insulin levels is our next test, the C-peptide test. C-peptide is a protein that is produced by the pancreas along with insulin. In fact, C-peptides help in the making of insulin and it is released into the bloodstream in equal amounts as insulin. So when C-peptide levels are up, insulin levels are up and measuring this helps us know if insulin production is happening or not. One important point to note here is that C-peptide is an indicator of insulin made by your own body. So if you see a low C-peptide level and high insulin, that means the person is producing low insulin in their body but is injecting insulin from an external source. The tests I mentioned up until now are all taken in a lab or a clinic. Let us go through what options we have at home for monitoring our sugar levels. Home glucose monitoring finger sticks were widely used since the 1970s. These were called glucometers. Home glucometers are cheap as all you need is a measuring device and plenty of testing strips. And these are helpful if you check your sugars constantly, but it never tells you what happens in between. Continuous glucose meters introduced in 1999 are more efficient and give you a whole picture of your blood sugars throughout the day and night. Continuous glucose meters use a skin-based patch which you need to change every two to three weeks depending on the brand. These patches can be expensive but they give a much better picture of when your blood sugar levels are spiking or dropping too low and they alert you of the same. A lot of innovations have taken place in this technology over the years. Many famous brands are introducing CGM with app and devices now. Main brands are Dexcom, Freestyle Libre, Sensonics which can measure glucose levels and products like Levels and Ultra Human which can also measure your sleep, heart rate and daily routines. It even has a food log and an exercise monitor as well. Monitoring your overall lifestyle routine can help in making better lifestyle choices. So these are some of the ways we can keep track of vital blood values that can predict our overall health with respect to diabetes. With better systems and technological advances in monitoring, it becomes easy to manage this condition. But what happens when things go out of control? In the next video, I'm going to talk about what happens as diabetes progresses. What complications can happen if we don't take charge and make better life choices. Till then, take care and I'll see you around.